Welcome everyone to the final episode of the Nepal Coexisting with Giants series. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and world traveler. If you've listened to the preceding four shows of this series, you've probably noticed that a very important voice has been missing. I felt the same way while I was in Nepal and was stoked when we had a chance to sit down with today's guest. Bijou Padal is a young Nepalese conservationist studying human-elephant conflict in non-protected areas. Elephants regularly visit her childhood village and cause havoc, and unlike other parts of the country, this village doesn't receive any tourism benefits from living with wildlife. So, understandably, she grew to hate them. She had a revelation one day when her mother explained that elephants are mothers too and are doing their best to survive. Bijou felt inspired and went into forestry to study how to minimize human elephant conflict in her home village. Now she's working as the Nepal Programs Manager for Sea Tree and a research director for the Himalayan Conservation and Research Institute. We do a deep dive into human elephant conflict in Nepal and what it's like as a young woman navigating her way in a male dominated field and culture. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening and share with a friend that you think would enjoy today's talk. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow. All right, everyone. And now my conversation with Bijou. So I'll start with my name <laughs> and my family background. <laughs> so my name is Bijou Baudel. I'm from Eastern Nepal, Zappa. And there are... There used to be, you know, I don't have father, so uh, there used to be 11 members in my family to my parents and nine all daughters. Oh, <laughs> so we have sisters only as well. Wow, <laughs> and I'm the youngest one. Oh, <laughs> so I have seen like my I'm working as a researcher. And I'm professionally, I'm working with Sri Tree, an organization which works in Nepal with the rural women to conserve the natural ecosystem. So we have these discussion classes related to environment because we think that women are not privileged with the education and they are the ones who are more connected to the nature and their daily life is more connected to the nature. So to try to make their engagement engagement in the natural resource management and then make them realize these current environmental problems, their contribution, what they can do and learn a lot about the environment uh, close to them, the forest especially, so that they can have their voice in the meetings because they will have this knowledge, this basic knowledge. So we have our discussion classes six months or yeah, it goes to like six to 12 months, but we have one manual ourselves and our environment. It's in Nepali. So we, we get one facilitator from a group of 30 to 25 women. We focus on women, but sometimes you work in the mixed groups, mixed farmers group too. So especially we want to focus on women. So now we get one facilitator from the group. We train them and then, and then they go back to their village with the manual and they discuss and, and we do the nursery project with them. They we have this one method called PRA, Participatory Rural Appraisal, where we have specified questions which we keep on modifying. And they discuss based on that uh, that particular questions regarding the forest, the native species, which species is important for them, and for what purposes, like for fruits, for trees, for firewood, for, you know, conserving, which one is uh, you know, the shape hearing from their environment that makes them realize what's the, what they already have in their environment and then what they think is needed for them for their daily life and for their community. So we do the nursery and plantation project with them. And then more than that, we encourage them to use the alternative source of energy like biogas or like, you know, solar panels we try to encourage them because we some somewhere we have this donation system or support system from the government so some of the people don't know so when they hear about these things they go to their local government or the concerned authorities to ask and get the benefits other than that i'm engaged with a ngo called himalayan conservation and research institute it's like our 
own creation. Like Suraj is the director of that, yeah. and I'm working as a research director. And I, I recently I have one a human elephant conflict project, minimization project, recently accepted by Rufford, which I'm doing through a Himalayan Conservation and Research Institute. So yeah, I'm going back. I think tomorrow or the day after tomorrow to Japa. So when I be where I belong, Japa, my community. I have seen the human elephant conflict since I have taken the birth. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a huge, huge uh, conflict over there. Like two or three weeks or maybe a month ago, two people were dead and an elephant killed them. In, in your village? Yep. Yeah. So, so did you know them? One person I know, the other I don't. And they were not much aware about elephants and they were trying to pull the elephant's tail they were trying to pull the elephant's tail yeah okay. so that is what i heard from my family members mm -hmm. but that didn't came in the media so it is like for, for, I, I i read in the online news that two people were killed from the elephant and we got that impression that elephants are bad they are killing elephants but then i talked with people there and then who saw the real incident or who heard about the incident, they realized that they were trying to pull the hair so that they can make some bracelet or something. I don't know, because mm. that's a huge, you know, tradition or like, you know, a prestige, like you have the ele mm. elephant tail as a bracelet. Now we have some law that you cannot use that or do that, but who, who knows someone is doing that in the eastern part of the Nepal with the elephants. So they were killed. I've heard that, but I don't have any, you know, real evidence or things like that. But I can understand why an elephant is attacking humans because they it might have disturbed a lot to, you know, disturbed enough to kill other animals because they are so clever. So I can understand how how disturbed they were. That particular elephant was to kill two human beings. One was injured but he was dead on his way to the hospital. So that was early morning. So you can imagine the conflict we are going through in the village. So yeah, when I was a child, when I was seeing those elephants coming to my house, trying to, you know, break my house trying try, we we trying to chase the elephants i was also like no i don't like elephants yeah. they they are they are disturbing a lot my family and we don't have a male member so that it's considered like you are not you know capable enough to travel or or do something in the nights because they come to visit the cropland or your house at nights so we just, we just have our father and then we, we used to help him to make him sounds or make fires because they are afraid of fires. So we didn't have the electricity back then. So that was really hard for us to you know tackle how to. And then it was kind of like neglected for, for the human elephant conflict in my community because there are other highlighted places, there are the areas which are close to the protected areas, mm -hmm. all the focus goes over there. And then other areas like Bahundangi, that's like directly connected to India. Mm -hmm. So that, I know that is another place which is highlighted for the conflict minimization. And we, you know, spending our lives protecting our home and our cropland and me struggling you know, while talking about the elephant conservation now is a really struggle. But we are trying. We are trying from our level best, trying to attract the attention from the government and the concerned authorities, even the local government. So, yeah, I was like, no, I don't like elephants. But later, I was, you know, interested in knowing more about them. And then hearing a lot from my mother who said that I'm also a mother. The elephant also have their children. Cats. Wow. So, so she, she, you know, she put that seed in my mind. Like, okay, they also have their emotion. They must be, you know, disturbed. And then after that, I did my intermediate after my schooling, like after 10 I started my forestry studies. I did my intermediate in forestry. After that, I, um, I 
you know, start to change my perception towards elephant. And then after that, I have this scholarship from the C3 organization which I'm working with. I was awarded as a work scholar, study scholar, and I got a chance to get my bachelor's degree in forestry so that gave me a lot of knowledge and information about this environment conservation and everything and after that i realized you no know, elephant every element in the ecosystem is important so i did my thesis bachelor's thesis on human elephant conflict and that gave me an insight on how it is going on what is the perception of people and after that i applied for first rufford grant they gave me small uh, rufford grant and then i tried to see the conflict hotspots so after after doing my research and bachelor's degree and doing one project with rufford I am like okay. I need to work something for my community and for the elephant because there is a lot of negativity going on in the perception of local communities because they are they are kind of like the victims with the elephants. So I applied again with the Rufford. I got rejected for for the second run. And after re, after one year, you can reapply. So I reapplied, and then now. I got it, so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so it's been like two months. My grant is accepted, so I have I have finished the procedure. So I'll be going back to my community to start my works. I have some training for the forest guards from the community forest. So it's not like the armed police or armed forest guard like the protected areas have. We have some other, they just have one long stake and they are responsible for protecting the community forest. So I, I, I feel like they are the one who know most of the inference of the elephants in the community and in the forest and they know for the movement inside the forest. So if I train them, they can, I think, help us to you know, pre, pre-inform us the entry of the elephants or where they are going, what's happening. And then we might take help from them to chase the elephant from the crop plant. So I'm trying to train them with few equipments. But I was interested in working with the school students because I know when I was in school, I was hating elephants. So I feel like there are a lot of school students who are hating elephants right now because they are struggling. You know, sometimes they cannot go to the school due to the conflict because they might have to wait, you know, the whole night and then the next day cannot attend the school. So I want to, you know, have some sort of workshop with them so that they understand that it's not just us, we are being affected. The elephants, they are equally being affected. So it's not like you hate the elephant. We need to figure out how we can, you know, cope with these things or stay together in this sort of community. So they need to understand what actual elephant is instead of what human elephant conflict is. So now, if we do not consider the human component, then I think it's it's not going to work because the population is increasing and the population of the wildlife also is increasing in Nepal. Like we can see the rhino count, we can see the elephant population. So I think it's high time. And another thing is that we have we have one perception in my community is that we are close to India and there are migrating elephants. So people are like, these are Indian elephants. So we don't want them. So oh. that's that we have Asian elephants and the species which we have is the Indian species. So so you cannot say like the one which is working in the rhino count is our elephant and then the one coming through the migration is India's elephant. <laughs> yeah. That's that's they not how you orders. Yeah. <laughs> they they don't they, they, they don't have this citizenship. So that is something we need to work on. Like you cannot do that that's that's their migratory routes before i think before humans they were maybe using that route before before we came there elephants were already there so we are using that that you know migratory route that's why we are getting disturbed so people need to understand like you cannot hate elephants just because they are coming from india 
so that is another challenge for us to you know overcome in the in changing the perception of people so this is what i am planning to work besides my work with citri <laughs> <laughs> Media aspect because I don't think we've really talked about that as far as like the news media. Yeah. yeah. So from your experience, since you know we don't know Nepali or have like links to any of the news, is it usually pretty bad stories that come out when these attacks happen? Like, yeah. What, what are they normally like? Yeah, like the news comes like one, you know, two people killed by a wild elephant. the headline suppose and then some people who don't want to go into into the main component or or main main thing of the of the article they will just read and okay elephants be aware they are killing people and and some of some of the news like you know they don't verify sometimes they give the news of asian elephant and put a picture of african elephant what yeah they don't even cross check it that happens a lot here in nepal do you just like, like yeah. <laughs> yeah they don't the, the i understand they don't recognize the species but they can cross check it yeah. they can simply google it they can just cross check it or have someone who had seen the wild elephant in nepal yeah. most of the people have seen elephant in nepal because they have one in the zoo most of the people have traveled to sauraha or at least seen in the tv but they don't even try to cross check it most of the times and it just doesn't happen with the elephants with the other animals too so the perception change starts from there i've seen like they give the picture of another animal and then write the news for another animal so two types of perceptions and negative perceptions for two different animals at the same time so we have seen that and we have been like you know raising our voice like at least you come to us and cross take it at least you know don't give the african elephant the the the, the pain that that the asian elephant i don't know <laughs> so it frustrates you so much yeah <laughs> yeah seeing the african elephant and giving the news of asian elephant like why <laughs> why do you see the ears <laughs> yeah like at least it's not the right one <laughs> that happens a lot that happens we have seen that a lot with a lot of species and in the news be like the elephant was wild it killed during the broad daylight and you know scaring people and and i i like the one the recent incident i i told you i talked with the other people from the community and got the real you know scenario of the incident because i knew that elephant will not come to you and then kill you because because few days ago i was in my home actually that day I got my Rufford grant accepted. I was at home and then I was I was you know print, I I got the printouts. I asked my sister to get the printer from her office. And then I got the printer and I was about to sign the letter and then I feel like okay that was about 12 midnight so I was like okay I'll do it tomorrow morning. I'll sleep now. And then I slept and I heard my neighbor's dog barking a lot. that's you know kind of a shine for us this dogs know the elephant when it is near but it is really co- close you know you know they get afraid and they stop barking so the elephant was coming the dog was barking and then i was hearing that but i was like no the elephant is not here the dog is barking for something else i let i let you know i was too lazy to you know open my window and then see if the elephant was there and within two or three minutes elephant hit our home and i heard the crack and the first thing i said was oh elephant hit our you know everyone get up i i cuz i knew that it just that i was too lazy to open the window and see it took one sack of potato from our store and it went oh my gosh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you can a sack of potato <laughs> yeah it did and then we screamed we screamed and then it you know 
carrying the potato on his trunk like a baby <laughs> and then and then wandering around our home and then and then it took it went away eating the potatoes we could, we were not able to find single potato in the field oh, it's <laughs> it 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 so yeah these sort of incidents we grow up with these incidents it's hard for for you know changing the perception of people because they are struggling really very hard in the communities but yeah they need to change their perception i feel like that's the only way we can you know find a way to solve or minimize the conflict first we have to work in the perception of people and change it and after that we can give them some sort of project or program or or any conflict minimizing solution so that they can really understand that elephants are important so let's do this for elephants and let's do this sort of activities for the human community so this happens <laughs> and and in the next morning everyone was like oh you got the grant for elephant conservation or 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 conflict minimization and elephant come to came to you right right <laughs> there to say you hi and as a treat as a party <laughs> it took one sack of the nut <laughs> oh my gosh it's so hilarious <laughs> so it sounds like the only communities that gets help are the ones that are near the protected areas. So, for like your village, let's say that something, you know, these attacks happened. Is there any like government support to help or, or what what happens? To my knowledge till now, I have not heard about any sort of government support other than the compensation. Which I am not in the favor of you cannot compensate a life for an elephant for the or for or the human being some some cash will not work but that is all we have and still the procedure like you'll have to go to the police station and everything and you are in the trauma and then and then within 30 i don't know 48 hours or something you'll have to have this verified from police office or something they have this sort of procedure so if you don't have someone who you can really trust or who can work for you when you are going through the trauma then you will not even get the compensation yeah. so even even i got cracked my at my house i didn't even bother to go to the police station and doing that sort of thing to get the compensation because i feel like i'll focus on something else i'll focus on repairing it rather than going to the police office and then waiting for the money to come through the government it's a long procedure though the forest officials in the conflict areas try to help i have some of my friends over there when a big incident happens i try to connect them you know for at least for the compensation so only the compensation even we don't have any support at least we can have some support for lights or maybe for beekeeping project or or you know some sirens or at least something for the community or any introduction of any alternative crops and then and then you know giving them the connection to the market or something but i have to my knowledge i don't have anything like that and and in the research part too it's my community is kind of like you know neglected cuz a small patch of forest small community let's focus on the broader aspect let's focus on the you know the areas which is directly connected to india the bro borders so so like you just the community is almost like forgotten in this big, big yeah world. while 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 someone has to get the information or knowledge or you know or the information or the news for for their news they will come to my community they will talk ask and write the news in the newspaper and okay that's the area for which has human and human conflict which is really high and that's it <laughs> yeah it's like i i don't i don't find anyone you know other than the compensation i feel like the local government the municipalities they are also kind of like passive in terms of human elephant conflict like okay you can cope with with this problem because it's been long the elephants are there so it's a it's kind of like a, a issue which is hard or impossible to address so maybe 
that's the, you know, the reason why we don't have you know, the attraction of the central government because our local government is also passive. Yeah, I have never seen any any political leader, you know, having this human conflict minimization issue on their agendas. It's a huge issue over there, but I have never seen any political leaders or even the municipality mayor. They don't have this issue on their agendas. They are they are like we have other issues to address. It's all been already been there. We cannot, you know, completely. Uh, you know, minimize or solve it, but they can give some try. They can try something so that we can figure out what will be the best. I'm just a researcher, and even I'm the victim, so I'm not the institution to solve everything. It's just my interest to work, and it's just I feel the responsibility for my community because I have this access to the knowledge or maybe the access to the people like you from the world which, you know, I can introduce them to my community and then and then show them my local scenario. I'm not a government official. I am not a political leader, so I don't have this, you know, strong backup to solve or to minimize the whole conflict within within two or three months or, with, or within a year. So I have, I have heard that a, a Division Forest Office in Chapa is working in the corridor maintenance. But it's it's a long, long project. It takes a lot of time. So maybe there are communities who need the immediate help. Or maybe they are in need of the presence of their government right now. So it's like, I don't know why. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, so it's I'm a lot. Yeah, for your community as well. Like, Talk about bringing it home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since you experienced it so firsthand, like your yeah. voice is that much more powerful. Yeah. And also for people to listen to you, because you're like, I am one of you. You know me. We grew up together, and look how my mindset has changed yeah. to these creatures. Let me teach you. Yeah. And yeah. If 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 you don't take the local support, like if someone else wants to go to the community to understand about the only the human elephant conflict, people are like, you just want to, you know, interview us or take our data for your publication or for your research and that's it. You are not going to help it. And even your research findings will not be that much helpful for us because in Nepal, it's research, it's... There are a lot of researchers. We have a lot of research work going on, but the coordination with the researchers or the research findings in the planning of the government is lacking in a lot of, you know, in a lot of planning. So it's like you just came here for your purpose, not for our purpose. So a lot of people, a lot of community people are like, I don't want to, you know, give you the information. What will you do? After hearing my problem, you'll do nothing because you have experienced this. So let's let's forget about your you know interview or or your data collection. So sometimes it's kind of like hard just to do the research. So that's why I try to approach Ruford so that this can support my research and then my activities with with the communities so that you know they can get at least some help. So right now, in my one of my roof uh, objective is to see the land use and land cover change. So we we developed this project to see the land use and land cover change, and and we feel like the forest area is changing into cropland or the settlement. That's the one of the region where we have this conflict, high conflict. So we are trying to see see that aspect along with the conservation awareness and minimization objectives. So. Let's see what will the result come, and then and we can you know maybe we can recommend something based on that objective, or maybe I can plan something else with the roof or or someone who can support me financially or technically for the community. It's amazing. I'm so glad that you just brought up the research thing. Mm -hmm. um, Focusing more now on the human aspect of like sharing stories like yours, because at first 
I really wanted to go the academia route. Mm -hmm. And I know some amazing people in academia, but there's such a pressure on them to just publish papers. Yeah. Like, you need to get your name on papers. You absolutely have to get your name in these journals. And if you're not in the right journal, then, like, your career is ruined. And so there's this constant pressure. Yeah. Always, always, always. But just like you said, but then what happens? So you find these recommendations and you're like, yeah. in the discussion section, this is what we recommend. Yeah. Well, who's actually doing any of that? Like, your recommendations are... Yeah, no one then is. what? Yeah. And the recommendations should be realistic too. And mm-hmm. other thing is like, you cannot recommend anything. Like, I don't recommend uh, this electric fencing around my, around my community because we tried it. The community forest user group tried it to fence it with the solar fencing. They spent a lot, but they used these wooden poles. They were all stolen by the community. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that happens. That's kind of like normal. <laughs> so that was, that was no use. And then you cannot fence the forest area because elephant or any other animal fencing is like a bigger you know cave you are creating a bigger cave just you know you are extending the area only so and then if the these animals are migrating then that's no use so and then people we we saw in news or we saw in in research or when we contact with the authorities we just saw that the fences around the forest but the fences local people are using within their cropland, within their household, no one considers that. And there are a lot of accidents happening. A lot of people are, you know, dying because of, you know, don't, not knowing the fault is the current passing through and forgetting to turn off the electricity oh. during the days. Being uh, electrocuted? Yeah. And then, and, then, and then one or two person was dead due to the electric current they have. Because that the wire was on the water in the river, and they were crossing, and then they forget to disconnect it, and then I think two or three people were dead. So electric fencing, I'm not in the favor of it. Because I also had one accident at my home. My sister accidentally tossed the wire with with wet water, see, with the water on her hand, and she got the sock. Because I have experienced that in my family. So I'm not in the favor of electric fencing, though it helps. It helps to protect your cropland. It helps to protect your house. But you need to be very, very careful while using that. So not every local people is, you know, careful enough or knowledgeable enough to know the voltage or know the capacity of the current passing through the wires. So that's even dangerous than the elephants because dangerous because elephants, they don't come on the daily basis, but you use the electricity in the daily basis. So that's even putting the community danger every day. So either you train them make them perfect to use that or 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 give the control to people who are trained enough to do that otherwise i'm not in the favor of doing or going with the electric fencing so that's that's sometimes that's even a different horrible situation using the electric conflict to chase the elephant and dying due to the current that's not what we want in the community. And when that elephant, it should yeah. it happen, and we why don't have even like got mm-hmm. close to that. Person? Yeah, and then sometimes we don't. We talk about the human perspective, but we don't uh, talk about the sucks the elephants are getting. Because we have seen uh, elephants with you know having smaller eyes. Maybe they got the current over there, and then and, and then the eye. He was disturbed. We had one elephant with a smaller leg, you know, one leg was smaller. And then we had these names for the elephants, like the one having small leg, the elephant which has which had small legs that appeared last night or something without the eye. So we don't know the reasons why the elephant has doesn't have one eye. Maybe that was due to the current. Or, 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 or maybe some other things we use, like maybe due to the firecrackers or, or maybe the stones people were using. 
so we are depending a lot in the local local uh, you know local activities or, or or local methods but maybe that is not that helpful for the elephant which we are not considering so that's another aspect for the elephant too so we really have to understand before you know having these methods or having introducing these things or or activities in the community there are some alternative crops i think you know like chili and like other mint or something which has strong smells so that elephants hate strong smells so we can use but one of my community member with whose house was close to the forest and his cropland was almost you know connected to the forest so he tried to plant one of these aromatic plants maybe mint or something but he spent a lot of money buying the seeds and everything cuz that's kind of expensive but later he could not find the market or extract the oil from that so that was waste cuz that was the land where he could you know produce the other crops to feed his family maybe elephant would have been you know dis- destroyed a little or maybe not but he tried to use the other method but that was kind of a disaster for him because he had heard from somewhere that he will not get disturbed uh, if we plant if he plants these other other you know plants or alternative crops but no one was aware about the market so they have they need to have this specified machines to extract the oil and you know selling it to the to the person where you can get the real value of it and the middle portion in the market everything so either we need a a a plan a concrete plan with everything from from the ground activities to the market so that local people can believe on that in 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 another thing is the chili production also like we need to know the market because if we just produce chili in our in my crop land then and i don't get the market then what will i feed my family i cannot feed them Chinese. chili <laughs> so so that's another another aspect we need to work on or it's not like those the forest researchers or, or division forest office can solve this problem then i feel like there needs to be a coordination between the local governments other organizations over there and then these technical people like the researchers and technicians from the uh, division forest office in a connection between the central government the local government and the division forest office so that we can figure out what can be done in the community otherwise it's like you know spending something or giving something just to you know distract them from the main agenda that will not work and the focus sometimes is goes only to the protected areas because they have a lot of activities planned they have the budget so they can work on the school students or or with the youth groups they have they work intensive works with the local communities youth groups in bardia so that's 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 the i feel like that's the sustainable way to make people aware and understand and engage the youth in the conservation but ntnc cannot come to japan and work cuz that's out of their reach so someone can adopt or change that method take some help from ntnc ask for the technical help and then introduce these things but that has to be a bigger project and local government are not like you know maybe they are not aware about this natural resources management or they just want the benefits and taxes from them so no one is kind of like spending money on the conservation or creating awareness thing so there are ways we can at least minimize it a bit so that you know local people feel like okay we can you know we can do something on this but the situation in bahundagi was so horrible that no one was ready to get married to that village really <laughs> area and and you you were not able to sell the land you know if you want to settle down to the settle 
to the other area like that happens in my community too like we are trying to sell it because we have we have a big big chunk of uh, land and now we don't have anyone who can support us to grow the crops or it's too much for us to manage because my only mom and my sister are there so we are trying to sell a, b- a little of it so that we can manage the other but we are not being able to spend like more than five or six years we're trying to sell it but you know no one is giving us the the price we we try to get so it's while negotiating everyone is like it's it last they're like oh, elephant will come and destroy everything so we cannot give them for free or with a little money as my my family my parents worked so hard to get that property and that's the only thing we have to support my mom or or whatever that's that's something which we you know rely upon though we work but we feel like we feel safe that that's our you know that's our support that's our backup so we cannot give that for free but in a little money to we has we are hesitating to sell it but we are trying it's been like more than 6 years i think we are trying to sell it but we are not being able to do so and the one of the major factor is human elephant conflict over there because my community my house is you know almost connected to the forest the community forest over there so it's like every month we hear this incidents and when the elephant is inside the forest we, like uh, i i had to go to the coaching classes early morning before the school and sometimes i used to you know just stop by the elephant and i used to get back to back to home and then i in the next day or or in the day i'll have to i'll had to explain the whole scenario to my teachers and then there were few students who don't know about this human elephant conflict because they come from the different different villages and they are like how why <laughs> why you are getting the excuse for not attending the class and why why i am getting the punishment for not attending the class <laughs> so <laughs> that is so now it's a pretty good excuse yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes that was yeah that's real <laughs> so i thought that was such a great recap of that there is something i would really love for you to chat about since we haven't been able to really talk about it because you're the first woman that we've been able to talk to mm-hmm. i would love if you could really go into depth of like women's role in conservation and what it's been like for you to enter this field okay <laughs> cuz we've only met with men and that's, so that's, you're a pioneer in that's, our eyes. that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> well in nepal it's a challenge for women it's more i must say it's a challenge while working in this field i feel all over the world this it is the same but here in nepal it's more challenging we'll have to you know uh, fight the stereotypes a lot here um i have also heard while doing my my bachelor's while preparing for the entrance exam for my bachelor's i also heard that it's not your field you will have to go to the forest and you'll have to tackle with a lot of you'll have to leave your comfort zone it's not a, it's not your area to work it's for male this profession is for male you will have to deal with a lot of people in the ground or deal with the forest or the animals so it's not your you know place to work you can study something else and get some job in the banks where you can sit inside the office and then you know get some fancy dress and job you know and if you try to work with the projects you will have to really work hard you will not get time to give to your family and then and then you are crushing your eggs to get married now it's time for you to focus on your marriage it's enough for your career so it's like you know hearing a lot and then and then and then another aspect is getting the harassment in the field like some people don't want to deal with the women 
some people and your sometimes your co-workers want to get benefits when you are in the jungle or in the community level or maybe staying in a same hotel they try to book single room so there are a lot of challenges women are facing but we women foresters we're not kind of like you know organized or we're not in the network but we were realizing that we need a strong network between us so that we can challenge this sort of things in the field after that we got one female foresters network we have this one it's a more a facebook group because everyone is in the facebook so it's been it becomes easy for us to contact or get the information so we have this one right now and in uh, right now uh, we have this webs leadership program from greek of thailand they are uh, working with 30 women from nepal i'm one of them i applied for that and they luckily <laughs> accepted um, accepted me so they are trying to create these women leaders so that we can influence other other women in from our field and and from the local communities for the leadership to make our participation meaningful because right now the scenario in Nepal is that we have the participation in numbers we already have from 33 to 50% participation in the community forest user committee but most of the decision is made by the male elites and then the the male who wants to support the women agendas are you know given names you know, yeah, you know like looked down upon yeah supporting. yeah you are you're supporting women you 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 are from the women's group or something like that so even that happens in our scenario too we have some some really supportive male from our our field too but sometimes they also have to hear just because they are supporting the diversity or the gender issues so now we are organized now we have this network we are fighting almost every day <laughs> we are hearing a lot you know so people are feeling like it's a fight against male it is not it is for the betterment of the society we want to have this gender thing you cannot serve us in the plate we just want to choose what we want to eat so that we can have our own menu or so that we can have our own you know own interest or own own, own taste so it's like you know sometimes we'll have to say that if you this day like change is happening it will be slow you'll have to wait for us now that's what we have been hearing so we don't want everything right now but if we are working or if we are contributing the same amount of time money or the sacrifices like like the other gender or 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 anything or other human being we want to have the same thing on our plate like if we are going to you know a restaurant for for like nepali khana or nepali dinner then if we ask for a set we spend for money for that we get the set that's it simple as that we spend from our side you give us whatever we are deserving because we are we are contributing for that so that's it simple as that for our rights so we are we are now female foresters network is kind of like fighting and coordinating and trying to change the scenario and now recently we have one human uh, one woman harassment case which came to the court and then the person was penalized with some money according to the law we have so we were like okay female now have this voice and people now can you know really be aware about the laws and their prestige cuz you know in in the office when you go to the office the the scenario the the treatment you get is different but when you are at home and the same person calls you or messages you in a different way so people when people or the community sees that the respect in the office or in in the public areas in 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 the private you know chats or calls or private meetings what's happening people are you know not aware about that and then and people are saying you have this numbers you have your participation you know where you are you you know 
raising these boys where are you trying to create the conflict but that's not the real scenario we are facing we are you know facing two different faces of the same people and it's sometimes hard for us to show the the the, the society the real face cuz because of the position of that person or the social uh, status he has or or the pressure we are getting from this you know so called elites we have ha- we have been fighting and we have now a strong support from the women's group because now we are organized we have this female foresters network so now it's like a uh, people in this conservation field who have heard about female foresters are like okay you are with the female foresters like you know like a satire they are giving us this you know statement but we are happy at least you understand there is a network for there is a network for women foresters if you mess with one of them and if that person is you know uh, strong enough to speak then then you will be you know that's not a good condition for you so it's helping for us we are you know, trying but while working with the local women in the communities it is really really hard like for the works i uh, from citri i work with the rural community women especially with the women and the for the facilitator we are like uh, one of our criteria used to be that has to be women so uh, so that we can create some at least one leader from the community and sometimes it ha- it becomes a struggle for me because i will have to talk with the local male representatives to find out the female or or get a female encouraged i need to get permission from her husband or maybe maybe the you know ward or municipality representatives or 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 some male to deal with them and then and then make them understand everything and then the woman who is coming knows nothing because they will you know translate whatever i say i can directly communicate with the women's group but sometimes they don't want to follow you know that path they, they the the male community want to be the deciding ones to send people so sometimes it results that we get women who is not even interested to work but see it sent cuz the 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 male or or the one or husband or or, or the one who is sending feels like okay she will gain some money or 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 that's another exposure for her that's kind of like a, you know like uh we if we we appreciate our training center in pohara they can say like, okay pohara you can go and enjoy the training not for the learning purposes so sometimes that makes the other women in said who are really in need who are capable sometimes it becomes hard for us to figure out the perfect fit and and the perfect community who needs the this sort of information of this sort of exposure so we are trying to work on that so that we can really figure out the perfect woman or the perfect need needy woman so that you know the woman elites in the community just they are not the ones to get these these sort of opportunities or exposure so we follow this pre participatory rural appraisal and we try to figure out uh, what actual the need is and then we we say that either that is a mixed group or women's only group the interaction should be participatory we need to hear from the late women's or maybe the women who are from the disadvantaged group and we encourage the groups with the leaders from the disadvantaged groups so that they can you know understand or they can also accept the fact that every woman is equal besides the caste or the gender or or, or the you know uh wealth status or or something so we are working on that we are really trying to figure out these needy needs from the community so for the natural resource management it's it's still you know a challenge for us to address this gender issue but we are trying we are really trying and we have some success right now and we now know that until and unless we speak for ourselves first 
we cannot speak for other women. So first, we need to appreciate for your contribution, your value, and then only you can support the other women. Because in the management of natural resources in the villages or in the rural areas, women play a vital role, but the credit only goes to the male because they are in the decision-taking procedure. So we just hear about their contribution, their meetings, their findings, you know, and for, and the, for the contribution of women, women, it is like that is their work. They are for that work. So they are just doing their job, nothing else. But that actually is a contribution which needs to be valued, which needs to be documented. And then only we can, you know, create the balance like women are contributing this much, we need some numbers so that we can, you know, argue or we can have this uh, concrete facts to argue with people. So that is one thing which we need to work and figure out with the community members from the women and men perspective so that we can plan something or, or we can get aware and at least talk about those things and then and, and talk in the favor of any gender or any disadvantaged groups. Otherwise, it will be just a topic for attracting the donors, attracting the uh, uh, audience, or just writing papers, you know, to get to get into, uh, into uh, you know, prestigious university for PhD or master's. If you have the gender issue, wow, you will get you will get this PhD in a, in a prestigious college. So that should not be just for for these degrees. Or that's helpful if you if if you have the gender issue in your PhD. What was your finding? As you spent four almost four, three years working on the gender topic, you need to be an expert for the particular community you are working with, or you have to have the exact data so that we can plan or we can have something. Because everyone has this, has made this gender word fancy, or you know something to focus just to get the attraction of the donors because it's compulsory kind of thing. So it's like we have a lot of work going on we have a lot of work and people are like you have worked a lot in the gender spect right now now you need to focus on something else or maybe you need to focus on the on the whole scenario right now but still there is a lot of things lacking so we also hear that when we call ourselves foresters who are organized in a group in, in the male foresters say that you want to be female foresters other than the foresters in general. And then we are like, we were foresters in general, but you didn't treat us like one. So we want to make you understand that we are female, but we are foresters. So we are female foresters. You need to understand that female foresters has issues. Female has issues. You need to consider this gender. So, so just to make you realize that this is female, we need to consider her voice. We are having this you woman in front of our profession or something, not just to make you realize that we are from quota system or, or where we are less capable just because we came through the quota system. No, that's not true. We, it was just a positive, you know, aspect for us to give us some space in the same area where you are standing. You are there to take decision on our behalf. That's not that's not acceptable. If we come through the quota system, we come for ourselves, our community, to make our voices heard. So you cannot just blame us. Just based on that, you came through the quota system, so you are less capable than us. You cannot say that we have our voice, we have, uh, you know, half of the population's voice we have with us. So we are trying to make people realize in these things. It's like, you know, it's been like a habit of hearing or, you know, giving them names, giving them names to us or blaming our activities or anything. But we are doing it just to make them realize that we also have, have our voice, we also have our contribution, and we can speak for ourselves. You spoke for ourselves enough, 
that's not working now let us speak give us the mic <laughs> we can speak ourselves you don't have to speak you you have your own agendas you can work on that if you are supportive enough then give us the mic now we want to speak we are capable enough to speak now so we are trying to create this environment right now we are working for the uh, women foresters only so that you know we can make safe working environment so that we feel free to work on our passion in the conservation so after that maybe we'll expand to other other areas too but right now that was a needed thing for us to work on so we are working have our webinars we have our meetings um we have some discussion programs we invite guest speakers uh, who can motivate us from our field so that you know we can hear their stories hear their struggle hear how we cannot give up in some stages when it's really hard there are people who who already were fighting for that and now they are in the better you know stay stays and position so we also invite people for webinar so if you you know can connect us or if you can be the one of those people who can share your experience and motivate our female foresters i think we will both be down for that 100% <laughs> i'm such a pro like how how can we support each other mm-hmm. that's what this is about right now this microphone <laughs> in front of you like, how can i yeah. just through the network that i'm building that we're building yeah. be a microphone for yeah. you yeah we can create a a global network of kind yes. of women who are involved in conservation no so that that was beautiful um and on that note since you currently have an audience what is the message that you want to share that if anybody hears anything what is the one thing that you want to make sure anyone listening hears um the message okay <laughs> what should i give i'm not that you know i'm not i don't think i'm in that position right now which who can give a you know life changing message or something cuz i'm still struggling with my you know daily lives my profession my work and and but still the only thing i got to realize is that never give up you will have to struggle a lot in my field obviously the conservation don't try to seek only the easy ways sometimes the 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 way may be difficult but the destination is beautiful and sometimes the destination might not be that beautiful the journey will be definitely so never give up keep on trying keep on struggling we we all women are together so so reach out to me if you need any sort of you know <laughs> backup <laughs> I'm 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 here to share my experience come with your experience let's share and then let's create a network it's not just for Nepal we can create a network and then the women from 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 the whole world we can work together for these important issues so yeah i think that's that's all from my experience I'm all crying I'm like oh no everything you said i know we have stories just like this yeah and we're from halfway across the world and all of our yeah. stories are similar yeah and and the fi- and the financial aspect is even worse you know if the woman is earning in the in, in her household she cannot decide how much she wants to spend for herself or you know the expenditure will be you know based on the male's decision like if you want to go beyond the household activities beyond your kitchen you know like uh, buying some property or buying some land they will take the decision you just have to spend your money and then they'll have everything on their name or 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 they want to take the decision on buying some sort of land or spending the money you have earned so and in the in the same payment system that is also you know not similar in a lot of cases in the government jobs that is fixed but in some other cases like some ngos and ingos they feel like that's an woman that's a woman that's that's enough for her somewhere you can hear that in the same position the male 
uh, colleague is getting more, getting paid more than you, and they, then you cannot complain. And they will say like they visit fields, they go out a lot, and then that's why they are getting much. If you try to send me for the same job, I'm capable enough to go to the field and earn the same money. But they have this, you know, mind pre mindset that women can be you know women can earn this much and that's enough for them so that's another big challenge we are giving the exposure to the women if women are getting the exposure but what's next what's happening after that what's going on with the money they are getting where they are spending this money so from we we don't spend a lot of money in giving admin cost or or you know salaries from C3 we try to minimize the cost and then work more in the community support uh, so still we give some stipend to the facilitators to the women facilitators so we are now trying to figure out or we are interested especially I am interested in figuring out where they are spending the money either the male elite is sending her just because she is earning some money or she has the control over her own money. So while I have, from C3, we work with Peshkar volunteers. Now they are all went back to America due to the COVID. And still we worked with the facilitators. That's why we want to connect with the local community, a facilitator or, or their representative so that we can sustain our program. So we went to the diverse communities, the rural parts like Chajarkot and the Rildhura. So that's kind of like more, you know, they come like more conservative communities. So we wanted to hear where they are spending the money, how, how, how hard it is to take decisions on, on spending the little money they are earning. So we want to understand that, but the thing, the 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 uh, you know, kind of benefit or or a positive thing I analyzed is the the woman I was working from the communities, the facilitators, they didn't have the bank accounts. Their husband used to you know give me their bank accounts, and I told them that you can open your own account on just one rupees or zero money. So you can go to the banks if that's near to your home. You can have your own account and then only I can send the money to the bank. So some of, in some of the cases, these of, uh, the husband felt pressurized you know, to get her to the bank and open an account so that I felt like they might learn about saving, going to the banks, having their own account on the bank. So if they work with some other organization, they will not have to say, like, I don't have a bank account, my husband has. So the whole control of the money goes to their husband. So I tried to, you know, create kind of a... A, a, a dependency on themselves for the women rather than depending on the uh, on their husband or their father or their brother to get the money they are earning. So that was a positive aspect for us. So I am interested in you know doing small survey and see where they are spending the money. So let's see what 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 will what will happen next. Because after this COVID, it's been hard for us to work with the local communities. So to communicate also, it is not easy right now. But COVID will not be here. Uh, the, 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 the year long or maybe the coming years or maybe the coming months, we will get vaccinated and get back to our planned works. <laughs> yeah. So let's see, there's a lot to do. <laughs> the Nepal Coexisting with Giants series was recorded in March 2021 with me, your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, and fellow conservationist Courtney Gonzalez. All of the stories shared are from the guest viewpoints and their first hand experiences. A special thanks to the Katie Adamson Conservation Fund for helping to support this series through their Conservation Travel Fund and connecting us with their amazing Nepalese partners. 
To hear more about KACF and their founder, check out episode two with Dave Johnson. If you're liking the show, hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a future episode. If you're feeling super squirrely, share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it too. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow and I couldn't do it without you. Until next time, my friends, together we will rewild the planet.